dear all, he uh, hello. Um, sorry for, uh, we had some technical problems uh, with, the, with this beautiful screen, uh, which is not working, but uh, 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 we are starting now. And t today we gathered for, uh, uh, for the first event in a series of events uh, dedicated to one of the projects of Arts and Culture Development Foundation, uh, which is also the commissioner of this uh, pavilion. Uh, it's, uh, it's a foundation running major cultural initiatives uh, uh, in Uzbekistan. Um, and uh, this new project is called the Frontier Magazine. And in this series of events, uh, we are basically having um, conversations and discussions about uh, key topics and issues that will be uh, important for our editorial team and our contributors. And one of those uh, topics is um, the Tashkent Film Festival of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, which was active since uh, the 60s till late 80s. Uh, so today we uh, invited our colleagues and friends uh, who are uh, researching uh, this story or are interested in it. Uh, so let me quickly introduce them. Um, Masha Salaskina, uh, she's on Zoom. Uh, she's in Montreal now. Uh, Masha Salaskina is the professor of film studies in Concordia University Research Chair in Transnational Media Arts and Cultures. Uh, here in Venice, uh, uh, we have also Mi Yu. Uh, Mi Yu is a curator. She's a professor of art and, and economies at the University of Kassel Documenta Institute. And Jan Zengu, a researcher and a film curator. He's a co-founder and uh, artistic director of Bibak and Cinema Trans Transtopia in Berlin. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, I think we could start with uh, Masha's uh, presentation. Hi, Masha, the floor is yours. Hi, um, thank you. Um, I am sorry I can't be there with you in person and I'm sorry you can't even see me. Um, so I will try to keep my comments brief because I know it's difficult to just listen um, to someone talk without anything to rest your eyes on. Um, so um, I was invited here uh, because I just finished a book um, that is dedicated to the history of the um, uh, Tashkent um, Festival of Cinemas of Asia Africa and Latin America. The book is um, titled World Socialist Cinema Alliances, Affinities and Solidarities in the Global Cold War. And um, Forkad asked me to talk a little bit about uh, how it came about and how I learned about the Tashkent Festival, which is really quite interesting because as a scholar of both Soviet cinema and, um, uh, well, at first Latin American cinema and then subsequently um, Asian and um, African cinema to some extent. Um, I really never came across uh, any mentions of the Tashkent Festival in any of the um, especially English language histories of Soviet cinema or in any of the histories of film festivals worldwide. And yet, as I was uh, reading various memoirs and documents um, from filmmakers from um, Africa, Asia, and uh, Latin America in the 60s and 70s, there were frequent mentions of it. And so it wasn't until I uh, met um, my colleague and friend Rosen Jagalov, who was working on the literary festival in Tashkent in 58, uh, and uh, who's uh, done significant work on Afro-Asian literary solidarity circuit, um, uh, to which Tashkent was really central. Um, and in connection to that, basically introduced me to the broader history of um, of the Tashkent Film Festival that I started researching it. And um, I was absolutely stunned by the scale of the festival uh, in terms of its representation of the cinemas of uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So it started in 1968, and already at the first, first edition, there were 49 countries from Asia and Africa that were represented. And there were 105 films shown. 
And then as the festival went on, by 1976, so 10 years later, uh, there were 109 participating countries from uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America, because Latin America was added uh, to the festival in the uh, 1970s, uh, with 210 films shown. Those of you who know the history of the um, um, circulation and exhibition of um, global films from the global south at film festivals would know that this actually, even though it may not sound like such a huge number, it is actually quite unprecedented and really unlike uh, anything else that was happening at the film festival circuits. Um, anywhere else. So just the sheer number of African, Asian, and Latin American films that were presented at these festivals, at these um, editions, really uh, constitute an exception, because it really wasn't until the mid to late 80s that the European film festivals shifted their attention to what we call now global art cinema, um, cinemas from um, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And the other thing that makes this festival absolutely unique is that um, its format combined different kinds of cinemas. So it included popular cinema, for example, which is really something you do not see at film festival circuits, generally speaking, um, as well as different kinds of um, political avant-garde films, ethnographic and industrial documentaries, as well as the more sort of um, auteur um, art uh, film production that you would usually expect to see at the festivals. So um, I, it really uh, constituted a very unique space cinematically in terms of um, what kind of films were shown, the geography of cinema that it represented. Um, and then as a space itself, another thing that I was really um, amazed by as I started researching the festival is that it really combined um, the more sort of obvious geopolitical objectives of Soviet soft power vis-a-vis -vis the so-called developing countries and a certain state of exception that I would call that really allowed for a kind of um, um, fluidity between the extremely formal and again geopolitically overdetermined uh, objectives and this um, uh, informal spirit of the festival to which um, the um, uh, people return in their memoirs over and over. It is constantly called the spirit of Tashkent and what it really refers to is this atmosphere of genuine celebration and again a kind of a transgression from formal to informal spaces that is very unusual for uh, Soviet culture. Um, and I think all of these uh, qualities also have to do with the film uh, festival's uh, location in Uzbekistan and in uh, Tashkent more specifically. So I look at the festival in my book as, on the one hand, um, an exercise of Soviet soft power that created very complex geopolitical relations vis-a-vis uh, -vis formal, um, official, cinematic, and um, political contacts with the institutions and filmmakers from Asia, Africa, and Latin America, but also as this kind of state of cultural exception um, with, again, fluidity where uh, the, the festivals would spill into the streets and even into people's houses, which, again, was absolutely unheard of in the Soviet Union, and also as a showcase of what we can think of as a global film culture uh, in a way that, again, was absolutely unheard of uh, during that period. And um, uh, I'm in interested in thinking um, uh, this festival in relation to a broader film festival networks in Asia, Africa, uh, and Latin America that were developing during that time. So, um, and here, it's too bad you can't see my slide, there's no point in me reading all of them, but actually contrary to what we usually learn in our um, sort of uh, traditional, very Eurocentric um, histories of film festivals, there was actually a very, very broad network uh, of film festivals that started in the 1950s and absolutely exploded by the late 1960s all over Asia, Africa, uh, Latin America, including Afro-Asian and third worldist uh, film uh, events that took place throughout the 1970s. And then, of course, there was the Soviet bloc's um, uh, film festival circuit that was also uh, quite different from the um, European 
uh, festival circuit, although uh, very much intersected with it. So uh, Tashkent fits in somewhere as a kind of a mediator among these different um, festival networks. And I specifically um, uh, look in one of my chapters at this question of the representation of women at this festival, because it's quite a complex question, because on the one hand, the women filmmaker uh, filmmakers were an absolute minority at the festival. Although there were actually films by women filmmakers presented there, uh, but as filmmakers, uh, women are practically invisible. Um, on the other hand, the construction of female stars from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Soviet Union was quite unique, highly politicized, assigning them a great deal of political and personal agency. And that's also something that uh, I found uh, very interesting and uh, worthy of, uh, of consideration. And then the broader question that I pose in the second half of my book has to do with what kind of cinema uh, was generated uh, through this festival. Because if we can think of each uh, festival as especially the large ones, as both um, bringing together and shaping a particular vision of what cinema is and the kind of cinema that um, it projects, the cinematic world that each festival kind of um, um, uh, imagines, uh, what kind of cinema can we, um, how can we understand the cinema that was screened at uh, Tashkent? And so this is where I came up with this um, term, world socialist cinema, and I look at three formations within it. Um, world socialist cinema of industrial modernity, world socialist cinema of cultural heritage, and world socialist cinema of armed struggle. These are just three categories that I can think of as almost placeholders for some of the major issues, um, uh, not just thematically, but uh, as a kind of cinema that really is rooted in these uh, problematics. And on the one hand, um, I should emphasize that I really did find that we see expressions of different articulations of socialism understood globally, worldwide by all of these different um, areas of the world and quite differently. So I am committed to the notion that this was socialist cinema from a kind of global uh, perspective. But behind it, we also see very complex negotiations and configurations of different cultural affinities, uh, some of which go even counter uh, our associations with uh, socialist cinema or socialism in general, uh, rooted in different kinds of histories that um, go across um, the areas of especially Central Asia, former Soviet Union, as well as Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So it is this kind of intersection and the traveling by the filmmakers, the films, and the imaginaries that it they constituted that uh, really interests me. And I think uh, the centrality of Tashkent to this very different geography and a very different cinema is uh, absolutely crucial. And it helps us position more broadly uh, Central Asian cinema, for example, vis-a-vis -vis the developments in uh, cinemas around the world, rather than being uh, always kind of uh, interpolated as a minor form of social Soviet cinema, or a uh, kind of a proto-national cinemas of the uh, individual uh, Central Asian republics, Uzbekistan, for example. Although these things, of course, were interconnected, but I think there is a kind of understanding of um, Tashkent as belonging to a world cinematic culture that is really revealed when we look at the history of this uh, festival in a way that I find extremely compelling and important now in how we think about um, these questions of the relationship of, again, different geographies and geopolitics uh, to the history of film culture. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Masha, maybe you could also um, pause a bit on your book project, project and uh, how did you structure it? Uh, what were some of the choices that you had to make? Uh, and quickly describe the process uh, uh, of uh, you working on this project. 
Um, yeah, well, uh, it was a very uh, strange process because most of the book was written during the pandemic. So I uh, actually was <laughs> unable to leave Canada for the duration of much of the writing of it. I started collecting materials a long time uh, before that. And most of the materials came from, uh, originally came from the uh, Moscow Archives of Literature and um, Arts, um, Ergali. And I have to say that a great number of people have helped me gather materials primary sources both in Moscow and in Tashkent. Uh, so I really uh, benefited from a truly collaborative uh, process and, you know, just great generosity and a kind of a spirit of sharing that um, I really hope uh, is uh, more of um, evidence of the changing culture, uh, academic culture and scholarly culture um, these days. So a lot of the materials that I got um, from the festival, as well as its coverage in the Soviet press, really came from uh, people's generosity and sharing sometimes their personal archives, um, translators at the festival, um, some of the filmmakers, you know, very generously shared their materials. I also talk to people. Um, I did not conduct any formal interviews because I found that formal interviews yielded very uh, sort of standard narratives uh, about the festivals while informal conversations uh, um, with an understanding that they were not going to be um, quoted directly and uh, um, sort of were off the record, but um, um, created this huge tapestry of oral histories and and of all kinds of experiences that people had at the festival and this is both its uh, soviet participants and the various international um, participants that was fascinating and again led me to really think of uh, the kind of affective space that uh, the festival represented and the kind of interpersonal and cultural uh, relationships that um, uh, were developed. And then, of course, tracing the films uh, was a huge challenge because, you know, these are not films that are, most of these films are not commercially available. Um, just identifying films was a huge uh, project because the programs that I had were from the uh, Soviet archives. They were in Russian. Um, using the Russian translations of uh, most of the films, very often without the um, director's name even. So you would have the country and the title. So then retranslating the title, knowing very well that translations of titles are a very creative process <laughs> and uh, trying to match it with the original. Um, and then even dealing with uh, like several layers of transliteration, right? Because you have, let's say, Arabic titles uh, transliterated into Cyrillic uh, uh, writing and then me having to, in order to cross-check them, re transliterate them into English or in, you know, Roman uh, alphabet. Anyway, so this was really, I feel like I spent years just identifying the films. And then in some cases where I was lucky, I could find them almost always through informal means, either sometimes copies were on YouTube, other times friends would have, uh, again, informal copies. Um, and you can imagine their whole, you know, let's say cinema of Iraq, of the 1970s, um, which was very well represented at the festival is just, you know, inaccessible, right? And so that was, um, um, you know, a huge challenge. And that's where I just decided that, you know, one of the um, things that I try to do in the book, and so um, the book starts with a general historical introduction into the uh, relationship between Soviet Union and Asia, Africa, and Latin America in the 1950s and 60s, and um, sort of leads to an understanding of where Tashkent fits in within this larger uh, history, as well as in relationship to the development of the film festivals um, in uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Then um, I spend several chapters actually just going through the festival selections. I couldn't, you know, this is not a complete uh, overview, um, and I couldn't identify every single film and every single filmmaker, but I try to sort of focus on some of the trends and some of the um, 
cinemas that were represented there, national cinemas, regional cinemas, and articulate how that representation was different from what we usually encounter in the narratives and in film history. Then I focus on the discussions because there were formal official discussions that were part of the festival. There were roundtables uh, taking place where participants gave official presentations, but then there were also lots of uh, press conferences. So I was able actually to find the full texts uh, in Russian of all of those presentations. So I give a kind of overview of um, those as, as part of the um, festival. And then again, I shift um, gears and really try to kind of generalize uh, about the kind of cinemas um, that were represented. And again, here I chose these three thematic or let's say problematics as my um, frameworks um, as again, industrial modernity, cultural heritage and armed struggle as sort of shaping whole genres that you see consistently from different countries uh, at this festival. And I was actually quite struck by, um, yeah, by, by a real correspondence or um, uh, sets of references that were shared, uh, both in terms of, let's say, cultural heritage, um, and that's something that I feel like is still not really fully uh, dealt with in, in film history, the degree to which literary legacies, for example, really get explored um, in this context, and uh, but try to be re-articulated as internationalist and socialist and Pan-Asian or Pan-African um, and um, again, armed struggle and particular position that third worldist internationalist position that most of these films uh, represent. Uh, and then, you know, industrial modernity as a kind of a problem of how is industrial modernity, especially from the position of quote unquote developing countries, different from what we think of as kind of capitalist industrial modernity. And that set of issues that so many of the films um, their deal with. So that's the kind of um, overarching structure. And um, and yeah, so moving between the different contexts, again, discourses, actual programming choices, some discussion of specific films, a lot of background histories, because, you know, for me, as for all of my readers, um, a lot of these stories were absolutely unknown, you know, cinema of Nepal or, uh, you know, cinema of, I don't know, Indonesia. Um, they're not commonly known um, uh, histories. So I do go, you know, by necessity, I have to provide sufficient background or at least some background to a lot of these um um, cinemas that are represented there. And then again, coming back to the positionality of uh, Tashkent within this, again, larger geography. I don't know if this answers your question, Forkat, but I'll be happy to to maybe address any specific questions when yeah. we have a discussion. Thank you so much. So uh, Masha's book will be published next year. Uh, Jan, I know that you are incubating another project about uh, this festival. Um, could you maybe introduce it or like? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the invitation, Furkat, also to the National Pavilion of Uzbekistan. I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, I'm curating or initiating a project called Destination Tashkent, uh, which will be implemented uh, end of the next year in Berlin at House of World Cultures and uh, at Cinema Transtopia. Um, um, the project relates uh, to the Tashkent Film Festival. I mean, on one side, uh, we would like to deal with the legacy of the festival, uh, focusing on the period of between 1968 and 88, um, selecting some films and uh, showing them within a film program. Uh, but also uh, want to um, create a space for discussion uh, with a manifold discursive program around that. And on the other side, um, I mean, the project is not thought to be as a merely um, historical project, uh, like with a historical focus, but on the other side, we also would like to uh, discuss the 
let's say, the space of possibilities uh, of the uh, new sort of thought-to-thought -thought collaborations um, and how we can learn from the experiences in Tashkent. And uh, this is also a very important part of the project, uh, to reflect the experiences that happened in Tashkent on today, uh, today's collaboration, artistic collaborations. Um, yeah, we also planned a publication um, uh, for the project. Uh, and um, I think that will be also a platform to bring together several uh, filmmakers, artists, scholars uh, uh, who are dealing with, uh, with Tashkent Film Festival, but also inspiring uh, themselves from Tashkent Film Festival. So it was like a huge, huge platform with uh, hundreds of films uh, in the program, and it's really hard to map like uh, maybe main or like important questions related to this festival. But maybe for you as a curator, um, why this uh, project and why this story of the Tashkent Film Festival is important? Or maybe you could mention some of the uh, aspects that you find interesting. I mean, um, as already Masha mentioned, I mean, think um, the, the Tashkent Film Festival was um, um, a kind of a contact zone as a platform for, let's say, a sort of cinematic internationalism, and which I find very inspiring uh, for, for our project. Um, uh, it was not just about films. I mean, the people were not just in Tashkent just for films, but also um, for a certain kind of um, exchange on films or some kind of exchange on um, filmmaking, uh, but also uh, some, some kind of uh, solidarity structures they were searching for, I think. And uh, I think this is what we need as well at the moment. Um, th this is one aspect what, what I f always find very inspiring for, the, for us. Um, the other thing is uh, it's very specifically uh, in Tashkent Film Festival, there was this uh, tradition of live commentary, live, live translation. So uh, the festival always had to deal with language and uh, oral commentaries, uh, translation, as again Masha mentioned this, this, this uh, it is quite difficult to find the film list because the film was always titled in Russian, but you know, like very freely translated Russian titles and you first need to identify which kind of film is that because you know, there is also this, this problems with transliteration and so on. Uh, this is one part, but also other part is like, um, it, it somehow enabled a kind of uh, accessibility for the audience there because you know the films were available uh, with Russian commentary uh, so you had like Russian in the speakers but uh, also on the headphones you had like English and uh, French later on also Arabic and Spanish um, and even if it's as a much more rare language let's say like in Wolof or Bengal there was a possibility to translate the film um, and this is one, another aspect which I find very as inspiring. Um, so, uh, while I was in Kassel this year, uh, I was reading uh, two books by Simon Chertok. Um, he was uh, one of the writers who, one of the most important writers, uh, journalist reporting from uh, Tashkent and writing about the films. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting um, that uh, I noticed so many similarities and uh, commonalities between uh, this year's uh, Documenta and the Tashkent Film Festival. Apart from this geographical focus uh, on the Global South, apart uh, from this sort of curatorial approach uh, when, uh, when uh, the organization is abandoning basically uh, um, uh, curatorial choices or like this idea of competition when the, when the selection of uh, participants uh, is made and this horizontal uh, logic, uh, etc. There are lots of similarities. So um, what do you think uh, is the 
for you as a curator or a researcher is the interesting aspect of uh, the story of the Tashkent Film Festival. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, w once again, thank you, Fokad, and, and to the Uzbek Pavilion for the invitation, and, and thank you, Masha and Jan, for giving us so much uh, uh, food of uh, 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 food of thought. Uh, to think with. Um, it will be very difficult to add on to any of that that you have already said, but I think I can try to find a different story arch because I don't do um, primary research on the Tashkent Film Festival, but I, um, I am very much inspired by it. And I think one of the reasons is um, is, a, is, is, a, is a re revisiting and, and sort of sharpening the definition of internationalism and to understand what was the reality of internationalism back in the time and also what are the realities and possibilities of internationalism today. So at the end of uh, my uh, rumbling, I think I'll get to the question that, that, that Foucault you just posted. Um, but I want to go do a bit of a throwback. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I could relate to is that there, there was the, um, as probably many of you know, um, there was an Asian Film Festival, or no, Asian Film Week that was hosted in Beijing in 1957, which is sort of considered the, the forerunner of this Tashkent uh, Film Week, and then later the Film Festival. Um, there's a Chinese artist, Liu Chuang, who's doing uh, primary research on that, going to the archives and all of that. Um, I think from the Chinese sources, you have uh, it, sometimes you have you, you, you get dissonance, dissonant narratives um, when they later visited the Tashkent um, Film Week and Festival, uh, which is that they thought the films are too, the films presented were too melodramatic, or you know there are some other genres that may not exactly fit the you know, this time of 1960s when China was full on sort of cultural revolution and world revolution and, and you know, perpetual revolution essentially. Um, so, so, so yeah, so China was really on the radical left side and, and considered many of the films not good <laughs> because they were too entertaining or they were just telling a love story. There is no place for love in revolution. Um, so I'm interested in that part um, and that brings me to, I guess, um, uh, uh, what are some of the sort of basic um, elements that will help us define internationalist politics of the time? So this armed struggle or sort of common struggle aspect that um, Marsha mentioned, I think, of course, is one of them. And, and, and so if we're focusing on that, I think the next question to ask is, um, what is, who are actually the actors behind that, right? Um, and, and what is the reality of the films, right? Do you actually show the films to, say, the guerrilla combat people, or do you show it to largely the workers? What, who do you show that to, and what are the responses? I mean, I don't have an answer for that, but I think that will be a, maybe a, as, a, as a next step in the, in the research, that will be a, a logical question to ask. Um, so I think one film that has caught my attention from that context is the film called Song of the Rivers from, the, the, from uh, GDR in East Germany, produced in 1954, which looks at the six major rivers of the world, uh, the Amazon, the Ganges, Mississippi, the Nile, Volga, and Yangtze, and how these uh, rivers are joined by a seventh metaphorical river, which is the working class movement, uh, sweeping right across the world, and that is it's a, it, it forms this sort of tidal uh, movement uh, as great as all those great rivers um, on Earth. And the film was really quite beautifully shot. Um, and I, I, but the most intriguing thing is the commissioner for the film is the World Federation of Trade Unions, right? Um, so I, I think, you know, once we have more of this, uh, the list of the film complete, we can start looking into who are the commissioners, what are the messages that they want to convey and all of that. Um, something that's closer to my own research is, is to look at other uh, visual cultures and how you have similar sort of um, um, a, a, a manufacturing or a sort of transfer of certain visual languages um, via, once again, via the sort of festival um, structure. Um, so, for example, there was also um, 
next to the film festivals, you also have some kind of graphic biennale or design biennale, because uh, for the socialist bloc, they do not necessarily consider fine art as the absolute sort of um, uh, 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 canon uh, or, or the highest point of, of, of art and culture, but graphic art and, and you know y useful art, utilitarian art is just as good. So there you, you had all this graphic design biennale. Some of them are still running today, such as in Ljubljana. Um, and I, it was very interesting to 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 piece together um, some missing, really huge missing puzzles in the history of, say, Southeast Asian uh, post-war uh, socialist art through the Dresden um, graphic biennale because some s almost 70 years after it happened, 60 to 70 years after it happened, um, all of a sudden, there's a collection that got unearthed in Dresden, and, uh, and, and, and in the collection contains uh, works from a leading Cambodian uh, communist uh, uh, artist, Sam Yon, who was um, assassinated in 1970 in the Khmer uh, Rouge, uh, the, the sort of anti-communist -com uh, massacre. As just as I think millions of other communists and many of them intellectual intelligentsia and 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 and, work, and, and uh, writers and, and 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 painters. So Sam Yon's work uh, works basically were lost in the country, and for 60 years nobody knew how his work works look like. And then all of a sudden, just a few years back, there's this collection that emerged in Dresden because. Um, because of a, a East German artist who had uh, befriended Sam Yun and who had invited him to Dresden to participate and got gifted all these um, uh, etchings and drawings. And after she passed on, uh, her family member all of a sudden found that. So, so things like that are really, really interesting for me. Um, another aspect, so, 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 so I, I think this is sort of one um, aspect of the of the reality of internationalism, what it meant for those who um, participated in it. Um, but I think there's another aspect, which is uh, what is the reception, what is the history of the reception of this form of internationalism and, and what it means for this kind of internationalism to go home. Um, and here I have some specific um, uh, cases that we can think with, which concerns how essentially this kind of international internationalism, internationalist politics goes home in China. Um, China, of course, um, had its sort of uh, world historical comeback um, I, 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 at, the, at the 1955 Bandung Conference, which was an uh, Afro-Asian third worldist uh, political movement, uh, as well as a cultural movement. Uh, the, 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 the happening of that, the sheer force, right, that the the third worldism brought into um, the political arena actually catapulted the Soviet Union to sort of also return to geopolitics and return to anti-colonial struggles because Soviet Union at the time was kind of more introverted or looking into itself. Um, so, so China um, has had its sort of geopolitical debut in Bandung. And soon after Bandung, there were all these um, initiatives to bring third worldist culture um, into China. So famously, the, um, the Oriental Song and Dance Ensemble was established in the aftermath of uh, Bandung. Um, and that is supposed to pr promote cultural exchange between non-online countries. And it, it has a repertoire that was visited also, as I think the, the Tashkent Film Festival was visit visited really by millions of people um, because they run every evening some, some uh, song and dance uh, program. And, and, and the programs basically included music and dance from Asia, Africa, and Latin America cultures. And they would send these actors to study in those countries um, back in the days. And, 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 okay, and, and here's a slightly thorny part of it. Um, various productions, especially concerning the African um, uh, uh, cultures, uh, featured dancers uh, who had their body and face, face, face painted black. Um, 
as well as wearing, of course, the, 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 the African costumes. Um, so this was in the 60s and 70s, right? Um, and you could justify that by saying that there was, um, and there are some scholars working on that, and, and they, 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 they try to justify that by saying that this is, um, this is uh, the purpose of that is, of course, to celebrate the local culture, and, and this is, you know, of course, decades before ident identity politics kicked in, so people were really unaware of that. But then, uh, just a few years back, at the Chinese New Year Gala, um, one of these famous uh, actresses who used to, to be part of the, the, the Oriental Song and Dance Ensemble, she, um, she appeared on stage, she's much older, she sang another African song, and she did it black, black-faced, right? And that, a few years back, triggered a, a huge um, outcry in China when people, uh, especially younger generation people, are very aware that this is, black-facing is wrong. Um, so there was a lot of media debates around that. The reason I bring this up is, obviously, I think one aspect of that is, um, if you look at the sort of cultural productions back in any of these individual uh, countries, um, what, is, what it does is essentially creating its own imagined um, other, Right? So in a way, China in those instances incorporated Africa as well as the, the culture, the, the struggles into an imagined global community. But that is actually a global, imagined global community by the Chinese, right? And then if you juxtapose that with other imagined global communities from other countries, there might be, and then you just juxtapose that with the, the real community from those countries or from those communities. Um, there might be a lot of discrepancies. And, and the question is, how do we deal with that? I mean, the, the black-facing thing is something that really goes kind of borderline, um, uh, not, not, I mean, not politically correct. Um, but then, at this point, I also want to draw on uh, Rossin's research, because he, he really traces very well how... Um, how um, the development of post-colonial theory as an academic discipline um, um, that is housed in U.S. or Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, academic institutions and generously funded from a certain point on, late eight, uh, 80s, essentially, how, how some of the proponents in these uh, post-colonial discourses actually they themselves were uh, participants in the in the uh, Afro Asian Writers Conference, or, uh, or I, I think he mostly draw on the, the the figures who are part of the the Writers Conference in Tashkent. So that means their own experiences uh, were shaped by these third world exchanges, um, as well. So physical uh, meetings such as in Tashkent, but also the the, the various um, literary circulation networks that were enabled also by the Soviet. Union of the time, and, and how paradoxical, or maybe not paradoxical it is for these exactly the same people to be incorporated into um, academic, elite academic universities, and, and essentially performing the same labor, because what they do is, um, is, is, um, uh, is, is, is a counter, um, Counter, uh, countering um, of uh, uh, Western centralism, um, but obviously when they did it in the third worldist context, uh, it had a very different meaning than when they did it in, or when they now do it within the academic discipline of post-colonialism. And, and I think that's something that kind of brings me to Foucault's question because um, I, I did observe this documenta quite closely, and um, one, of the f f f one of the sort of um, deciding moments for me is to realize that um, we don't really have any institution, we don't actually have any adequate political institutions for internationalism today. You know, the Soviet Union has collapsed. Um, China has gone on, moved on from a, uh, from a Maoist, the f fervor, uh, a, a Maoist time of, of a perpetual revolution and all of that. Um, 
even the more recent institutions, for me, the, one of the last uh, being the World Social Forum, um, which was established in the, the year 2000 uh, as an aftermath or continuation of all this uh, counter outer globalization movements under the banner of Another World is Possible, where you really, at the peak, had 150,000 uh, activists organizers, unionists, but also uh, people fighting indigenous rights, land rights, LGBTQ rights, all of this coming together to empower each other and also to have a cultural program alongside. Um, so all, even that as a last instance of um, internationalist politics um, for me as an institution has uh, receded into insignificance. So when we don't have political institutions for internationalism today, what remains is sort of a performance or performativity of that, but more like the cultural expressions or residues of that, um, that many of that ended up in our world. And that's why this documenta looks a little bit like the World Social Forum, for my, to my taste, 15 years ago. Um, but actually, the deciding factor is that when Ron Rupa, I mean, I'm not against any of the initiatives, but I'm just pointing out one little fact, uh, that is when Ron Rupa was um, invited to actually participate in the World Social Forum as uh, potentially a political um, collective. Political, uh, politically, no, pol art collective making, pol making political art, let's say. Uh, they rejected it <laughs> by saying it's too political for us. <laughs> and I have to say that is quite unfortunate. And in the, same doc uh, sorry, in the same World Social Forum that was back in the year 2004, Taring Padi, which is this other Indonesian art collective that has made this huge banner that uh, was later um, removed because of anti-Semitist charges, created all these controversies and all of that, they actually participated in that World Social Forum. Um, so, to, yeah, at least until 2004, they were true to their mission, being politically committed to a sort of internationalist politics. So, yeah, I mean, I can go on and on about why this documenta is not uh, an embodiment of uh, internationalist politics, but I also have an article that just came out on EFLUX, so <laughs> I'll just point you to that without going too much further into that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we can uh, switch to questions if we have uh, in our small group or in audience, I don't think so. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything uh, that we would, love to, would like to develop or continue in this conversation or we can pause a bit and uh, treat, this, t treat this take as a rehearsal and continue next time or what do you think? I mean, I'd like to ask Marsha maybe, because I, I started, I really started thinking, what does it mean for this in, in, internationalist politics to go home at the time? D have you researched on any, any sort of repercussions or uh, 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 ramifications of, um, uh, of, of any of these films? What, what kind of reactions did that trigger back home? So you know, a, a film from an African nation. Y you know, you would probably have a review of that from the F Tashkent um, Film Festival archive, but, but do we have access to the reality of that back home? And how can we construct a, a much larger narrative around that? Yeah, um, it's a really interesting question. And of course, as always with the festival at this scale, uh, there's like an absolute range of um, possibilities from it actually boosting the uh, careers of some of the, some of the filmmakers and, you know, it being kind of very widely publicized in the positive sense. And uh, two, there are certainly cases where... Um, uh, with the shifting right Cold War, global Cold War politics, uh, there are, you know, in some cases, I guess, um, the some of the African nations were always, um, it was a sensitive topic, right? So, you know, for someone like Usman Sambene and um, um, 
Vieira, who were both uh, really, really um, um, active political and cultural fig figures in Senegal, but at the same time were always kind of at odds with the Senegalese politics um, at the time. Their participation uh, was always kind of closely watched, and there was a lot of kind of double complex relations right where like on the one hand for a lot of and this is senegal is just one example it would be a good it was a good um kind of publicity to have uh their filmmakers represented at these films especially you know again figures like vieira or sambene that were you know sort of the figureheads of African cinema, the pioneers of African cinema, but they were very closely watched and their engagement with the Soviet Union was um, was very problematic for Senegalese uh, politics. And there are a lot of examples. I haven't seen as much for the film festival as such, but there are certainly a lot of examples of um, both African and Middle Eastern filmmakers who were educated in the Soviet Union, who after they received their degree and went back to their respective countries, basically just perished, right? And, you know, faced political recriminations, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I know this a little bit better in the context of the film education, because of course, Soviet Union also and socialist bloc more generally, Germany is Germany was very, very active, as was Czechoslovakia with FAMU, uh, providing educational opportunities for filmmakers. And a lot of those stories, when you trace what happened to those filmmakers, are ones of then kind of repercussions that they faced uh, when they uh, brought at home. Um, Syria is always a very interesting example, and this is where I think Kay Dickinson's book Arab Cinema, Cinema Travels has a chapter on Syria that mentions, again, not specifically the Tashkent, but Syria then in the 80s was very well represented in Tashkent. And it was virtually for Syrian cinema, uh, Tashkent in the 80s was the only place of international um, uh, um, cinematic exhibition of Syria. Syrian cinema. It, Syrian cinema circulated on televisions around the Middle East, but not on the big screen. And so there, there are also very complex kind of sets of political uh, repercussions. And then what I found, um, it's actually closely related to the question of China's position on the circuit. So I guess we didn't say this, uh, but um, because, you know, of the timing, you know, the, the festival started in 68 um, after the Sino-Soviet split. And again, as, as uh, we were just talking, about China played um, a role of uh, providing or trying to provide an alternative center for third worldist uh, socialist internationalism. China was never, um, Chinese cinema was never included um, in, in Tashkent. Um, the, as there were some Chinese uh, cultural figures and filmmakers who uh, participated in the festival later on, but um, however, it was not an official exclusion, unlike Israel, uh, Taiwan, and South Africa that were actually officially excluded from the participation. And there's conflicting evidence as to whether Soviet Union invited China and China declined, or they were uh, saying they were inviting China but didn't actually um, uh, do it. It's it's tricky. But precisely the uh, Maoist um, um, leftist filmmakers uh, were seen with suspicion. Right. And so it was kind of a tricky thing, which, of course, <laughs> most of the Maoist um, um, leftist filmmakers were European, so they were not really part of this festival. But there were some Latin American um, um, radical filmmakers who were largely aligned with what could be seen as more pro-Chinese position, um, you know, with Che Guevara, obviously, um, with the Guerrilla. Um, concept of armed struggle being much closer to the uh, Maoist conception than the Soviet one. So there were some discussions uh, as to, and this is actually something I'm also looking into, I haven't been able to determine this, uh, but like some of the Latin American filmmakers actually 
chose not to participate in the festival or were just kind of hesitant because of that um, question, not um, in terms of their state governments, but precisely in terms of even their position within their own, um, you know, uh, political circles, right? Whether Soviet Union's uh, engagement was seen as largely, um, largely, uh, well, um, imperialist a form of of imperialism right so um i don't i mean there are a lot of so many different iterations of how that played out but i think it is really fascinating because we do learn a lot more about precisely kind of the real the realities and the conceptions of internationalism when we look at these uh, histories of what happened, so to speak. So not just what was said at these meetings or even what the films projected, but the the personal and artistic biographies of these figures. Yeah. I think I also would like to use the opportunity to profit from Masha's uh, knowledge <laughs> at that point. I have two questions actually. Uh, one is um, uh, one aspect that I find very interesting is in Tashkent uh, is this diverse and very inclusive programming, uh, which means, I mean, on one side they had this um, um, political films or like militant documentaries or ethnographic documentaries as well. But on the other side, <clears throat> there were like popular dramas or let's say like blockbuster films from India and Egypt. Um, do you know a bit, I mean, can you elaborate on that a bit more, Masha, maybe how the audiences uh, came together in the Tashkent? What were the intersections also with these audiences or were they completely uh, separated from each other? Uh, this is one point. And the second is also, um, as in our project, we are also thinking, try to make some discoveries or rediscoveries, uh, some, some, some cinematic positions which were maybe neglected uh, over the years, um, or like filmmakers maybe that were neglected. Uh, we try to find these films as well in the archives. So what happened basically uh, with the films that have been shown in Tashkent? Is there a certain archive who's responsible for the memory of Tashkent Film Festival or? Yeah, this is maybe the second one. Well, I'll I'll start with the second west question because that's a million dollar question for all of us. So the answer is we don't know. And I'd, here I'm speaking for like all of because you know there's kind of a group of us who are trying to do the research. And uh, um, uh, I think this will be actually really important next step to get um, uh, some insiders involved because, as you know very well, these questions usually can only be answered by insiders. Officially, you know, and now with the with the Russian film archive being basically inaccessible for all practical purposes. For for most of us. Um, there's a suspicion that in the Gosfilma Fund, the official Soviet film archive, which is now the Russian film archive, may have a lot of the copies, if not all of the copies, because it was a standard practice for them to keep copies. But, you know, no one can confirm or deny this. And again, right now, like none of us are in position or have any uh, desire to, to go and, and try to investigate that. What remained in Tashkent really is a question that needs to be explored. Again, this is not like officially we don't know, right? But I'm sure that this is really a question of, of asking people who were involved in the organization, because exactly as was the case with, um, well, Germany, right? Like in the Arsenale, there's a, uh, a separate um, sort of archive of films that filmmakers left after they, for example, presented their films at Leipzig and some of the other festivals, right? It's possible that there are these shadow archives 
we just uh, we haven't um, uh, found them yet, but it is entirely um, entirely possible. The same way as, for example, the film collections of the Soviet friendship societies that existed all over the world uh, had been largely discarded, and oftentimes those collections actually included not only Soviet films but films of international solidarity from all over the world. You know, Vietnam, uh, Palestine. Um, you know, leftist filmmaking of, of different kinds. So some copies of those films are floating in those archives that are also in no man's land, because as those societies cease to exist, some of them are like kept in people's garages or in personal libraries. So this is like a huge archival investigative um, project. Um, and then in terms of the audiences, this is really fascinating. And I was also trying to understand, you know, how it worked. And at least from what I could reconstruct based on um, uh, talking to people, interviewing people, and I even like put out a call on Facebook at a certain point, asking people to just like send me their memories of having attended the festival and what they saw, what they remember for a kind of a very non-scientific but you know some kind of sampling of what uh, what the audience is actually so because all of the films were very well attended and that was like the shocking thing of course the more popular like the blockbuster films again especially of course Egyptian Indian melodramas but also a lot of the sort of bigger films were uh, screened um, at this really huge 2000 seater movie theater while you know like political documentaries or you know some of those other sort of let's say minor forms were shown at much smaller venues but from what I could gather they were all packed and I remember when I asked one of the filmmakers who was there at the time, you know, precisely who attended industrial documentaries from, you know, Syria. Um, and uh, he just said, what, are you kidding? You know, you don't understand. You young people, you're used to having like everything at your fingertips. You know, this was a chance to see how the world looked like, what people did. And yeah, OK, you know, it's going to be the hydroelectric stations and, you know, the whatever temples. That's OK. So like you still get a glimpse of the world that you would otherwise not uh, get. And, you know, it was Soviet Union. Everyone was used to the political rhetoric. Like, like no one would be put off by the kind of expected formulaic articulations of, again, you know, the struggles for liberation or, you know, the need to build, uh, you know, socialism, like everyone was used to it. So that was not a problem. People still would go and, and get what they could. And a lot of the times because so what I kept hearing is that because many of the filmmakers and the um, actors and actresses, even of those less, you know, popular films were present. It was also this really, really rare opportunity for the audiences to interact with these very exotic and very exciting figures. And so, you know, apparently everything was packed, even though talking to the translators, right, the simultaneous translators who were doing the translation, they made it very clear that like, oh, no, some of the movies were really boring and people did leave some of the movies. Right. Um, but my sense is actually that there was basically an overlapping audience. This is and of course, like as the 1970s and 80s progresses, even in the Soviet Union, the segmentation of audiences and taste cultures and their especially within the intelligentsia positions vis-a-vis, -vis, um, let's say, socialist rhetoric, including internationalist rhetoric, um, become much more segmented. And yet still an opportunity like this. This was basically seen as a kind of a festival where everyone was curious to see a lot of things, right? So the audiences were, in fact, overlapping and not kind of fully segmented. And again, like maybe they were looking for different things, you know, not necessarily the articulations of, again, political solidarity in some cases, right? And, you know, some were drawn in by the sheer exoticism of it. Uh, but some still filtered it as a kind of an opportunity for genuine sense, again, of sort of affinities with the people from other places that they otherwise had very little opportunity opportunity to have direct contact with. So in that sense, you know, it really did provide a kind of horizontal 
um, interaction, even between the audiences and the guests, right? But of course, you know, like the, you know, Shashi Kapoor or, you know, whoever, like the 70 stars, you know, who were there, of course, they would get, you know, a hundred times uh, bigger audiences. And Egypt was a very uh, particular example because in the 70s, because, you know, from um, um, 1970, right, they were talking about Sadat's uh, government. And, and yet the Egyptian uh, representative Presentation at the festival was massive, but it was exclusively non-political uh, melodrama. And in fact, the Egyptian uh, leftist filmmakers were often present through the other um, delegations, whether through Syria, Iraq, right? Um, not as part of the Egyptian um, uh, delegation. So then you could see some of the works of basically Egyptian born filmmakers, but through the other um, uh, Arab cinemas, right? While the uh, Egyptian films were 100% um, kind of popular melodrama, really most depoliticized. Uh, in fact, by far the most depoli depoliticized of the, uh, of the film selections because India uh, had everything. Right. They had, you know, popular cinema. They had parallel cinema. You know, Mernal Sen was a very regular participant. Right. As well as um, state documentaries. So basically the whole range of possible production of, uh, in fact, that's true for South Asia more broadly, including Pakistan and, and Bangladesh and, and Sri Lanka, right? But Egypt was only popular cinema. So it's a very, very complex kind of interplay, which again, you never get to see at a film festival <laughs> when you're now or then. I have sort of a conceptual consideration. It's not really a, it's not a historical question, but I think it's something that maybe f that, that, that concerns all of us, our practice today, because I am, I mean, I, I, I mentioned earlier in the case of uh, Chinese black facing in, uh, in the seven, in the 60s and 70s already, right? Um, this, this aspect of cultural appropriation, but it, it does feel like the cultural appropriation actually as a concept came in, uh, or after the the, the discipline of post-colonialism, right? So in a way, like, can we even talk about cultural appropriation under internationalism? Is internationalism a sort of warrant that, you know, you can actually depict other cultures because you genuinely feel in, in solidarity with them and, and that you sh genuinely share a, a political common struggle so that it's okay doing that, right? And then, I mean, so the high day of, say, uh, uh, internationalist politics is one thing, but also, as Masha, you pointed out earlier, the internationalism also sort of segmented, and then you have, I mean, I'm thinking of this one film, um, no, actually, yes, a, a one a Filipino film, I believe it must, has, it must have been made in the 80s, if not earlier. It's a Filipino film about Cengiz Khan, Right, and there's this amazing, like completely, like almost random. You just don't know where it it, it comes from, but but you know they made it quite melodramatic, um, and of course they only use Filipino actors, right? And then you see something like that, and and of course I mean, and, and interestingly, the the film was shown. Um, the film was called "To Tie a String Around the World," if I'm not mistaken, because it quotes the. Uh, purportedly a line from Chinggis Khan that to his lover that he would uh, he would start um, with a string and he would uh, use the string to wrap around the world to arrive back at her feet <laughs> so to tie the, to, to, to tie the string around the world to express his love um, now the, the film was actually shown at, uh, at Venice Art Biennale a few Quite a few years ago, at the Filipino Pavilion, and and uh, by sheer coincidence, the Mongolian Pavilion was just next door in the year, and the Mongolian <laughs> artists and and and, and, and public, uh, they were they were really they felt really unflattered. They were like, "This is a blasphemy to our culture, right?" I mean, they didn't use the word cultural appropriation, but then it's sort of like, is it is it okay, right? Is it okay for Filipino? <laughs> Filmmaker to depict the Mongols, 
because maybe both of them were, you know, third world at the time, and you know, and, and this is not even about internationalist politics, right? This is just people's sheer imagination of other cultures, and 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 then if we could accept that back then, what makes us so somehow, what makes our hands so tied today in terms of doing something like that, right? What will, what would be a, 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 a a condition for us to, you know, to be genuinely interested in each other's cultures today without feeling the, the weight of cultural appropriation. Can I ask why were the Mongolian, uh, uh, rep well, the uh, members of the audience offended? Was there something specific that, you know, it's, offended them or more just the idea that Filipino artists or filmmakers I, I, I would take on I cannot pin it down. I cannot pin it down and I don't want to say my speculation, but I think it has something to also with, I think it has something to do with the look of people or skin color. And like, you know, all these things that mm. are very touchy these days, <laughs> right? But then how can, can we, should we use today's um, lens, right? And many of that color by post-colonial theory, as I said earlier, can we use that to apply to a, a time before that? But I think, I think actually looking at, that's why I was asking, I was, I'm very curious, because I mean, you're absolutely right. I think it's a question that we're all kind of tortured by, right? Um, um, because, you know, the alternative is what we just endlessly uh, navel gaze and talk about ourselves as the only, <laughs> as the only subject that is safe to explore. Uh, and again, what possibility for solidarity, you know, is there in uh, such a, such an approach. But I, I do do wonder sometimes about like the reception i mean at the time not because uh, as you're saying of course historically it changes and you know um but um because i always so there was um a really famous um armenian uh uzbek um dancer who was um uh, a big part of the Stashkan celebration and she was just a very famous um figure who started dancing in the 1920s and 30s primarily and even langston hughes met her and so she became um tamara hanum and she became like a, a, a um icon of dance internationalism because in her dancing she would incorporate like every possible dance in the world and I forget the numbers but something like you know by the 1950s she would travel the world and had in her repertoire I don't know 115 different uh, regional local dance cultures from like literally over the world and then she traveled and she pe performed this to the people people, you know, whose dances she was incorporating into her repertoire. And it was precisely perceived as uh, interest in the other cultures, at least from, again, like hard, it's hard to know how true these accounts are, but it looked like the audiences were actually enthusiastic and, and thrilled to see these elements integrated into, you know, her performances. And yet precisely, I actually had this experience of um, um, uh, going to an, an art exhibit that had images of precisely those kinds of things, right? Like solidarity performances in dance and all of my students just recoiled and said this is this is absolutely unacceptable you know and this wasn't blackface it wasn't you know there was not 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 to that kind of recognizably problematic extent but just you know definitely <laughs> dressing up in in local uh, or understood to be local clothes and performing songs or dances and yet again this was kind of the form of internationalism that was, from what I could gather, really understood on both sides, right? Like it wasn't imposed. It wasn't, um, it was really read as, you know, the same thing as when Paul Robeson would sing, you know, Russian folk songs as a kind of a sign of solidarity between like Russian serfs and American slaves. You know, it was seen as a gesture of, of uh, recognition, right, of, of, of solidarity. But I think there certainly are plenty, as you mentioned, <laughs> instances where these things go awry, but usually the local audiences recognize it as such.
but it's fascinating. Like, I don't know if we can have a whole, I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to wholesale uh, uh, reject this because this was the language, like this was the search for a kind of a uh, universal language that could retain particularities of national, regional, local culture, and yet kind of create something that was, uh, you know, shared and, and heterogeneous. And that's how it was understood, not as an appropriation, because the power differential at least was understood to be different, right? Because, of course, that's one of the crucial questions, right? Is it a hegemonic culture that is appropriated a culture vis-a-vis -vis which it stands in kind of imperialist or, or hegemonic uh, relation, right? Which very often in these kinds of articulation, that wasn't the case. Um, but I, it's definitely, I think we're all struggling with that. John, what's your take on this? Have you encountered this? I mean, I was now at the moment thinking about um, not very much on internationalism, but also at the same time, you know, I know, for example, Maybe you can also um, definitely have some more examples on that, but on, um, for example, this Soviet orientalism, you know, like how, for example, Central Asia was perceived in the Soviet films partly as a, um, um, as a geography uh, which is within the Soviet Union somehow um, was like, Playing the other, you know, like you know, this this uh, this, uh, this, this, this as a possibility to reflect this Orientalist imagery. Let's say, I mean, if I compare it with, uh, let's say, with European uh, um, uh, Orientalism, um, I don't see a lot of differences. Honestly, I mean, um, the same uh, white saver. Uh, uh, figures are also functioning uh, as its function same and the uh, uh, films which was done in I don't know in France or in Germany so um, uh, but of course I mean there's this aspect of international which is also included in that films um, it's very spontaneously I was like thinking about this uh, you know how the orientalist imagery also functions in the Soviet Union also regarding to Central Asia. I, I agree me that with the, with the shift of, of, that happened after internationalism, when we, when we became like, like excessively maybe cautious about depicting identities, uh, working with identities, but not only others' identities, but also our own identity when you are, um, when you are basically uh, existing in this uh, mode of constant doubts about uh, are you like self-exoticizing or are you um, uh, using uh, your identity as a way of uh, monetizing your uh, practice, etc., etc. So, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting um, direction of thought that we should maybe connect it with those big shifts in uh, international relations like this uh, problem yeah so maybe <laughs> we should it should be a wrap because uh, we are freezing here <laughs> in the pavilion it's quite cold thank you Masha for joining us uh, uh, via zoom online and I hope this conversation will continue uh, next year, as we mentioned, uh, your book is coming and uh, John's project is uh, coming and our publication. So for sure, this conversation will continue. Um, let's yes, and I'm hoping yeah. to meet all three of you in person. And I am actually planning to come to Berlin in June uh, for the uh, Arsenale Archival Assembly. And uh, so I really hope that we'll find uh, other opportunities to have this really, really interesting conversation in person. Because I do think that this is precisely an example of a lot of us coming from slightly different backgrounds and different positions and yet really looking to construct new kinds of ways of thinking and new practices surrounding the art world.
world and uh, cinema that I think we should cultivate. So I'm uh, really grateful for um, for for Kat for including me, and I'm really hoping that this is a beginning of a uh, a longer uh, conversation and dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.